So let's get to treatment. Um, the most important treatment we can do is IV fluids. And because of the unknown status, usually at the beginning of treatment uh, of electrolytes, we'll start with uh, uh, normal saline, 0.9% saline is preferred initially. You can use a balanced electrolyte solution like lactated ringers. Um, most important thing is that you use an isotonic solution until you get your electrolytes back. Uh, as you go further into treatment and you rehydrate the animal, usually potassium chloride is added to normal saline um, in cases where you've basically identified lower normal potassium levels, particularly if renal function is adequate. And uh, later on in treatment, potassium can be given as potassium phosphate, particularly if you diagnose a low serum phosphate, as is often the case uh, in diabetic ketoacidosis. So the first thing we want to do is calculate the fluid deficit in an animal and their percent dehydration times the body weight. Um, we'll give you a figure in liters um, in terms of the fluid deficit. Of course, you usually want to translate that to milliliters and then divide it up. Um, most of the time, the fluid deficit is added to a daily maintenance amount of about 50 milliliters per kilogram. And then as you, if you have an animal that's vomiting or has diarrhea or significant polyuria, you wanna be estimating these as well. And this is one of the advantages of having a urinary catheter in place in an animal that's, getting, um, that's diabetic and is getting um, treated with aggressive amounts of fluids. Uh, first of all, you wanna make sure the kidneys are still functioning. And secondly, you wanna make sure that um, you are uh, keeping up with the fluid uh, loss that is associated with the diuresis. A really important principle to keep in mind is that fluid therapy by itself will often decrease blood glucose um, significantly, even before you start any insulin. So you can see several hundred milligrams per deciliter uh, drops sometimes in blood glucose, even just after rehydrating the animal. Now, potassium replacement and its refinement is generally something you do once you get the animal rehydrated. You know, the renal function um, is doing okay. Creatinine and BUN might be back to normal or uh, coming down at least. And the basic principle here is um, we show you some guidelines. This is basically this empiric table of potassium levels and um, the amount of potassium you might add per liter of fluid. Um, but the uh, critical principle here is to recognize that as you start adding significant amounts of potassium, you're starting to reach a maximum potassium administration rate in animals, which is a half of millimolar or half a milliequivalent, it's the same thing, per kilogram per hour to avoid cardiac toxicity. And so what I've done here is to basically give you an idea of the fluid rate that you can give that's containing this amount of uh, potassium in it. Um, and you can see that you, you know, we're talking about milliliters per kilogram per hour, not per day. So it really would take quite a bit unless you get to very high levels of potassium, in which case you probably ought to be monitoring the ECG at the same time as you're giving fluids. So let's take a look at the rapid acting insulins that we have available. Uh, regular insulin is the only regular insulin and these rapid acting insulins are the type that can be given by IV or intramuscular means. Um, and so regular insulin, uh, the trade names are shown here, Actropid, Novolin, Humulin, and other rapid acting insulins that are uh, insulin analogs, insulin Aspart, Glycine, and Lispro insulin. We'll talk about Lispro insulin, which is a Humalog. Uh, as an analog to rapid acting insulin in diabetic ketoacidosis because there's been some studies on that. So basically you use a constant rate infusion or intramuscular boluses. And the main thing you wanna do is to avoid sub, initially at least, sub-Q therapy due to the fact that um, if you put a bolus underneath the skin and the animal's dehydrated and you rehydrate, you'll have a completely different um, uh, availability of that insulin to the patient. It may not be absorbed at the beginning. 
and at the end it'll start being absorbed more rapidly. So uh, you need to um, ideally administer this by a, an IV or IM root. We'll give you some protocols about that. So to start with a low dose constant rate infusion of insulin protocol for diabetic ketoacidosis. And um, we'll distinguish between the doses we start with in dogs and cats. You place an IV catheter, you start your saline, put an IV, uh, urinary catheter in, it's a good idea. It's not necessary, but it's a good idea if you can to monitor, as I said, the diure diuresis, make sure the renal function um, is continuing. Uh, one of the biggest reasons animals in diabetic ketoacidosis will die is that they develop uh, acute renal failure. And so then you add regular insulin to a second saline solution that is can be administered in a couple of ways, but we'll talk about two here. Protocol one would be 1.1 units per kilogram per cat in the, and in the dog, 2.2 units per kilogram per dog into 250 milliliters. And then using a pediatric infusion set or an infusion pump, where you would administer 10 mils per hour. Protocol two would be simply to divide up in your fluids 0.5 units per kilogram per day. Obviously, this gives you less control um, and you have to adjust upwards or downwards. Uh, but if you don't have an infusion pump, this, this is also a way to do it. Once you start the CRI, um, monitor the glucose you know, every two hours. Sometimes it's the beginning every one hour. And then if you don't see any change after four hours, you want to increase the insulin maybe by 25%. And um, you keep doing this. You keep checking the glucose, monitoring um, how things are going. Uh, if they're going in the right direction, you probably stay your course. If they're staying the same or going up, you, you increase the dose. Continuing, go, you're monitoring urine output. And electrolytes, uh, remember insulin is going to drive potassium into the cell. And then as you get glucose down, you may want to switch your saline solution to a dextrose containing solution. This is sort of a, an art, really, uh, whether you start with 2.5% dextrose and saline uh, or lactate and ringers uh, when the glucose uh, reaches 250 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, you can continue to administer regular insulin. The idea is that you are that in, that glucose in there. Yes, it will be hypertonic at the beginning, but with the insulin present, um, and you do not want to stop the insulin, uh, you will draw. You will that glucose will have really no osmotic effect uh, in the extracellular space. So you want to maintain your saline, your balanced solution as either 0.9% saline or a balanced solution like lactate and ringers. Um, you adjust the glucose and insulin, and sometimes you have to increase the glucose up to 5%, but do not stop the insulin if you can at all avoid it. You keep the animals on this regimen so they can eat without vomiting, because that's the key. You have to, they have to keep the food down in order for you to allow use of a longer um, acting insulin. So um, in that case, you would stop, once you make that decision, you stop the insulin in the after, afternoon or evening, and then start treatment of the uncomplicated diabetic the next morning. Now, there's been some experience um, with other short-acting insulins that are available in human medicine, Humalog, uh, where the lysine and proline are switched uh, in the human insulin chain. And so this is this product is also a short-acting insulin that can be used and has been used in dogs and cats. So basically, the products that have been used uh, for treating DKA are uh, recombinant human insulin and Lispro insulin. We'll talk about that uh, study now. Lispro is a genetically engineered analog of human insulin, in which proline and lysine are switched. And um, it reduces the tendency for insulin to form dimers and hexamers and allows for a greater, uh, rapid, more rapid absorption and elimination from the sub-Q injection site, which is one way to give it. Uh, but in this case, we're giving it IV, so that really isn't a factor. It results in a, its rapid onset and a shorter duration of hypoglycemia when given sub-Q. Uh, 
So CRIs of List Pro in the dog showed shorter time to resolution of, ke to, of ketoacidosis compared to regular insulin in one study. And um, it showed uh, in another study a, also a shorter time to resolution of ketosis um, compared to regular insulin. So that's one theoretical advantage of using List Pro insulin. In the cat, basically, an IV study showed no fundamental difference in, in the PK or PD um, behavior of these products. Um, but you'll still find um, that both, based on availability and cost, you'll find both products being used in dogs and cats for treating of diabetic ketoacidosis. So this, this slide is a complicated one, and one you probably ought to just study or print out or, or find the re primary references that I've given you here and here. Uh, but basically, it shows the general approach that I talked about with regards to a sliding ladder of uh, both insulin uh, administration rates and over here and um, dextrose over here. Uh, based upon whatever the um, glucose concentration might be at a given time. And these protocols have been uh, applied in the studies that are shown um, on the right. And so this is just a starting point, but the general principle I described before. And the same thing for the dog. Uh, you notice that you have um, here instead a, a higher fluid rate uh, but you basically are looking at mixtures of, in this case, they've, they've chosen half-strength saline with dextrose because that's a product that's available. Um, the one disadvantage is you're not providing as much sodium to the animal once you switch away from 0.9% sodium chloride. Um, that would be the only critique I'd have of this particular protocol. But up here, you'll note uh, these, they're mentioning that they gave the dextrose in 0.9%. Um, sodium chloride or ringer solution. So you, you start with this general framework, and then of course you adjust individually as the animal goes through its treatment. Now, for a lot of people who are in practice uh, may not find uh, a constant rate infusion or uh, very convenient, you don't have the monitoring staff, um, and you definitely don't want to have a situation where you have a tricky. Uh, IV catheter, and then all of a sudden the animal runs a lot of insulin in um, or it stops. So using a, an IM dose of regular or Lispro insulin is also a strategy. And the way that this approach goes is that you give a fixed dose of regular insulin at the beginning, and then you monitor your glucose every one or two hours as before. And then when the glucose, um, either you know, within, say, four-hour period, the glucose doesn't fall below 250, you'd been administer a repeat dose. If it does fall below, um, you would then wait. And, and then once it does hit 250 again, you give another 0.1 units per kilogram IM. So this is much more manageable by somebody who's trying to manage uh, a, an animal in a practice without uh, a lot of technical staff. There are important other considerations in uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. First of all, I realize that sometimes an animal that's been previously stable might have developed an infection, and diabetic animals are prone to infection. And so if you do identify um, that there is an infection present, for instance, in the urinary system, make sure you use bactericidal antimicrobials because uh, you basically have a poor immune system in this animal. They have an immune suppression uh, in diabetic um, patients. Um, be very careful with using sodium bicarbonate to combat acidosis. Remember, what you're doing to combat acidosis is to stop the keto acidosis. And so insulin is your bicarbonate in this sense. Um, so usually insulin therapy with fluids is enough and the reason that you worry about overtreating with sodium bicarbonate is because there's a well-known um, situation where using bicarbonate and overdosing with bicarbonate can, can lead to an exchange 
and and acidosis in the central nervous system that can actually stop the respiratory drive and lead an animal to stop breathing. So that's that's another reason to be very, very cautious with sodium bicarbonate. That's not to mean that there aren't certain circumstances where you can use it, but just be very cautious. Um, anytime you have an animal with diabetes and you want to try to figure out when they are ready to be going on intermediate or long-acting insulin, be very careful with the use of antiemetics. Uh, you're trying, to, again, let's put it this way, proper diabetic treatment is going to make the animal feel better and is the antiemetic in this situation. So just be very careful. But sometimes vomiting is so um, difficult for the animal and you want to get some food into it and you can't you know, give parenteral administration of um, all of its calories, for example, then sometimes you may need to go to an antiemetic. Um, as I said before, the absence of vomiting in the animal's appetite are key to determine whether you can progress to an intermediate or long-acting insulin, as they have to be eating to be safely given these products. Now, the final thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the, uh, what turns out to be a fairly rare situation is what we call hyperosmolar coma which is a situation where the animal does not have ketone bodies, but can have extremely high glucoses. Usually they're at 700 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and this hyperosmolality leads to its own problems with regards to what's going on with the animal's mentation, because it's sucking water out of the brain, et cetera. So the way to estimate the osmolality of a patient is shown here estimated as twice the sodium, which is the major um, cation, and the glucose concentration in milligrams per deciliter divided by 18. So when you can see as that number gets really large, the glucose gets really large, you can have a very significant increase in osmolality. The principle of treatment is to be very careful at decreasing glucose um, because the brain, as it accommodates to the hyperosmolality will develop its own, what are called idiogenic osmoles. And these idiogenic osmoles in the brain are trying to prevent water from being sucked out of the brain. So when you drop the glucose too quickly, you take away this factor right there and water rushes into the brain and you can get cerebral edema. So you have to be very careful in uh, reducing the plasma osmolarity, osmolarity in a patient like this.